Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing? This is a wonderful Wednesday. Um, I don't actually have anything off the top, Matt, so if you want to go ahead and um, kick sure. us off. Um, in Capri. Yeah. Does the secretary... Do you wish you were there? I do wish I was there, yeah. but, you know, I'm not. Yeah, same, all of us. We can all pretend to be in Capri I'm, here at the Daily Press Briefing instead. Uh, does the secretary, while he is there, plan to have any uh, Mideast, uh, other than the one group meeting with the G7 that's about the Middle East, does he have any... Uh, bilateral plans? Uh, I don't have any uh, additional meetings to preview or get ahead of Matt, but I, a, a veteran like yourself, who I'm sure has been to many G7 meetings, um, knows that uh, many important diplomatic conversations happen on the margins, and our G7 partners um, continue to be important uh, uh, allies and partners when it comes to uh, a lot of our goals when it comes to the conflict in Gaza right now, namely continuing to press for additional humanitarian aid, uh, doing everything we can to continue to secure the release of hostages and also in light of the events over this past weekend, continuing to support um, Israel's security and self-defense. So I suspect there will be additional conversations on those topics, but I don't have anything to preview okay. or get ahead of. And can you bring us up to speed on his, uh, did he have any additional calls on the way? No other, no additional calls to read out. Um, no. uh, okay. And uh, then lastly, What's your latest understanding from the Israelis about what they intend or not intend to do? So, uh, look, Matt, uh, again, I don't have um, any uh, updates or anything to, to offer on that. Ultimately, um, this is a, a decision for Israel to make. It's their own decision, uh, but we're continue to be engaged with Israeli officials and, and members of uh, the Israeli government. Uh, to everyone, though, we continue to emphasize the importance of avoiding further escalation. And we're working uh, with partners in the region and around the world to um, continue to create a unified diplomatic response to Iran's reckless um, and irresponsible behavior uh, over the course of this past weekend. Okay. Uh, and then, sorry, I said that the last one was the last one, but this really is the last one. Um, is, but you've seen that both uh, David Cameron and, um, and, and Baerbach, the German and British foreign, minister, uh, foreign ministers, were in Israel ahead of the Capri meeting. Right. Um, Secretary has no plans to follow suit? I have no travel updates to, to, right. to, to offer a preview at the moment. Um, go ahead, Daphne. Uh, David Cameron said it was clear Israel had made a decision to respond to the Iranian attack. Have you gotten a similar message? Uh, I'm not going to speak to the specifics of uh, our diplomatic engagements with Israeli officials. What I can just say is that, again, uh, these decisions are for Israel to make as a sovereign democratic country. Uh, we're continued to be closely engaged with Israeli officials, uh, but we also continue to uh, stress the importance of further escalation. The United States certainly isn't interested in um, uh, getting into an all-out conflict uh, with uh, the Iranian regime, but uh, we'll continue to work closely with partners and allies in the region, as you saw the Secretary do over the course of this past weekend, with the number of counterparts he spoke to about uh, creating a unified diplomatic response to what we believe is Iran's reckless and irresponsible behavior. What contingency plans does the U.S. have to contain the aftermath of any attack should Israel choose to be ahead of I'm just not going to get ahead of hypotheticals or speculate. Uh, what I can say, though, is that um, since October 7th, since uh, the events of this past weekend, we have remained cl closely lashed up with uh, partners and allies uh, when it comes to events that unfold this past weekend alone. You all saw the call uh, readouts that went out, and Matt spoke to of this a little bit on Monday. You saw the secretary speak to his counterparts in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt. Um, he spoke to Israeli officials as well, and we'll continue to have those high-level uh, diplomatic engagements. Okay, and sorry, I've just got two more. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the UN Security Council looks set to vote on Friday on a Palestinian request for full UN membership. 
diplomats tell us the resolution has the support of at least nine members. Does the U.S. plan to veto this? I'm not going to preview our, our U.N. vote. Uh, broadly, though, Daphne, you know that the United States remains committed to uh, a two-state two solution, and we believe that the only comprehensive and uh, realistic path to that is through lasting peace and through direct negotiations between the parties. Uh, but broadly, we'll continue to remain engaged with colleagues on the Security Council and um, on any resolution that may or may not come forward. Uh, and then UNRWA has said that some of its staff members and other people detained by Israeli forces in Gaza were subjected to ill treatment, including severe beatings and being forced to strip naked. Have you been in touch with the Israeli government on this and what's been their response? Yeah. So we uh, are aware of this uh, recent report that the UN put out highlighting some of these allegations of extensive human rights abuses. Um, we're deeply concerned by these reports and uh, we'll continue to press and uh, engage directly with our Israeli partners on the need for a full investigation into these uh, allegations and um, <laughs> accountability for any uh, perpetrators. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I don't have any uh, specific uh, conversations to read out. We, of course, are in touch with our Israeli partners um, all the time. Uh, but broadly, though, we continue to call on um, all parties in the region, uh, call on Israel to do more to protect humanitarian aid workers, to improve deconfliction mechanisms, and to uh, pursue full accountability for incidents of harm against aid workers. Thank you. Do you have any Jay. updates on those deconfliction <clears throat> mechanisms, this coordination response? Is that fully stood up? Uh, that is something our partners in the IDF uh, can speak to. I don't have any updates. And then do you have any updates on any of their other commitments and whether the U.S. has made any assessments on whether that's sufficient so, to change so, U.S. policy? So, so look, Jenny, um, uh, let me just first say broadly that we are encouraged by reports of increased assistance flowing into northern Gaza, bakeries reopening there, and other uh, steps that we're seeing a positive collaboration between partners and Israeli authorities that demonstrate the executions of some uh, commitments that our partners in Israel have uh, outlined. Uh, but, uh, and I want to stress this, certainly we continue to believe that there is still a need for sustained, significant, uh, multi-sectoral humanitarian assistance. Uh, we think it's crucial um, and more uh, must be done. And um, as military operations continue, Israel needs to take all feasible steps to minimize civilian harm. Uh, so we'll continue to press these things, but uh, some, some, some metrics that you asked for, we have seen um, openings of northern crossings and seeing the maximization of routes from Jordan. Uh, we have also seen um, uh, Erez reopened on April 14th, which uh, allowed a number of uh, trucks entering daily we expect some further enhancements there as well. Uh, but again, I want to stress that uh, while these are positive steps in the right direction, more absolutely needs to be done. There is uh, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is uh, dire. Uh, and that is why we are continuing to pursue an, uh, a, an approach uh, when it comes to humanitarian aid that includes bolstering and supporting and continuing to push for additional land convoy movements. Uh, you saw earlier in March us conduct a number of air drop operations. You've seen the Jordanians and others do similar things. And in the State of the Union, the president spoke about uh, the maritime corridor as well. These are all things that we think need to be pursued aggressively given the dire situation, and we'll continue to do that. And any updates on Rafa? I don't have any updates on any conversations or anything. Go ahead. Uh, Vidal, just to follow up on uh, your statement earlier about the uh, your efforts to have a unified uh, respond, diplomatic respond to Iran's attack between you, your yep. partners and allies. Is this designed to negate the need for Israel to respond militarily or regardless of that? So Israel is going to make its own uh, decisions and its own determinations as a, as a sovereign country, um, uh, irregardless of what uh, transpires in that department, we continue to believe that it is important to hold the Iranian regime accountable for what we think is uh, reckless, malign, and destabilizing behavior. You saw uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan speak a little bit to this yesterday, uh, and so we'll continue to work directly through our systems, uh, multilaterally, through forums like the G7 that Matt was alluding to, uh, the UN and others, in ways that we uh, will hold the Iranian regime accountable. Um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank yeah. you, Vidal. On Thursday, April 11th, the State Department spokesman, uh, Mr. Miller, said that Biden administration fully supports the rights of the Israeli people 
And, and for our audience, could you explain a disconnect between the Biden administration's words and behavior, how on one hand, can, that you can say you fully support the rights of the Israeli people, and on the other hand, not fully support the rights of the Israeli people to defend themselves as they see fit and have a follow-up? Do you have a specific example of how uh, we, they, we are not encouraging them to defend themselves? Well, so, you know, specifically about you know, not allowing them or, the issue of uh, a counterattack against Iran and not, uh, not allowing them to easily go into Rafah to take care of Hamas, uh, delaying this. Uh, Israel could have been into Rafah a long time ago, so the audience really concerned about the disconnect about they see, uh, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration preventing Israel well, Doc, from, from going I, I, to Rafa for these operations. I, I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. I think you are um, in a, can't, frankly, in a misleading way, uh, uh, conflating two very uh, different issues. Uh, one in the context of Israel defending itself against um, attacks from Iran. Uh, we believe that they have every right to do that, and they should. And you saw the United States um, echo, underscore that commitment to Israel's security and its self-defense uh, this past weekend. Uh, and that is a commitment we believe is unwavering and it is ironclad and we will continue to feel and believe strongly in Israel's ability to defend itself in its ability to feel secure um, in its region. Uh, but separate from that, in this conversation of Rafa, it is important, again, that we underlie when we're talking about Rafa, we are talking about more than a million people uh, seeking refuge. We are talking about a region that is continues to be an important conduit for humanitarian aid entering Gaza, and it continues to be a uh, access point of uh, safe departure for foreign nationals. So yes, we believe very strongly that any military operation in Rafa in the Rafa region uh, should require significant, serious planning that addresses these three major areas of concern. That but, continues to be something we feel strongly about. Along that, our audience is concerned about the pressure on Israel to accept the two-state solution that you were talking about. And, and so, um, so what is your response to, to our audience that really believes that is a way of uh, hurting Israel when many Israeli people do not support a two-state solution to the idea of sharing their land with terrorists, uh, specifically uh, you know, with, with Gaza, with Hamas, that Hamas uh, blew their opportunity to, to really have a peaceful area there. Well, I and, hope and so I hope you're not, I, ho I really sincerely hope you're not making the claim that um, all Palestinian people are terrorists because oh, that no. certainly is not the, the case. Um, and quite respectfully, I'm less interested in uh, what your audience is interested in, more uh, what we think is uh, good policy and what we think is beneficial to peace and security uh, in the region. And that we have long felt continues to be uh, a two-state solution. That has been our dire belief prior to the events of October 7th, and it will continue to be so. We think that that, that is the only credible path forward uh, that assures um, equal <coughs> measures of peace and security for the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. Well, along with that, what do you say? I'm going to move people around. That you've gotten three questions already. Except. Willie, you've had your hand up. God. Um, sorry, Lenny. Uh, could you have any um, update on the investigation into what Israel actually hit in Damascus on April 1st? I don't have any updates for you on the status of that facility or anything like that. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Vedant. So you support a two-state solution, but it seems you also oppose Palestine's membership at the UN. Do you think this is contradictory? I don't think these things are contradictory at all. Uh, again, as it relates to the United Nations, I'm not going to preview our vote. And as I said, we're continuing to engage with our partners on the Security Council. Uh, we remain uh, unwaveringly committed to a two-state solution and continue to feel that the only path forward is a comprehensive, lasting peace is going to be through direct negotiations between the parties. And that uh, continues to be uh, what we think is the best path forward. And when you say a two-state solution is it like uh, a Palestine is it a Palestinian state based on 1967 borders with East uh, Jerusalem as the capital what is your understanding of the two-state solution so um, 
I don't have a change in definition of how we have been talking about a, a two-state solution. We've been talking about this as a, a, a Palestinian state for the Palestinian people, and of course the state of Israel, um, with uh, the boundaries uh, bounded by uh, 1967, uh, I believe mutually agreed upon um, land swaps as well, with the status of Jerusalem being a final status uh, negotiation issue. Just one more on Turkey. Yeah. Do you have any read out of- On Turkey, you just on said? On Turkey, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any read out of uh, Under Secretary John Bass's travel to Tur Turkey? I, I don't. Uh, I don't, but I'm happy to, to check and see if we've got any additional information there. I know, uh, just to say broadly, Turkey has been uh, an important partner of ours in a number of key lines of efforts uh, uh, under acting under Secretary Bass. Um, as you all know, used to be ambassador to Turkey, so he has a lot of deep and close relationships there and have no doubt that he's engaging on some important issues, whether it relates to peace and stability in the Middle East, but also continuing to engage with our partners in Turkey on issues relating to NATO and Ukraine. Uh, go ahead in the back. Yeah. Uh, two questions. I have one on Haiti and one on. Uh, can we stay uh, in the region and I yeah, can try I and come back for, to you? I have one for the yep. West Bank as well. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I keep asking this question, trying to rephrase it in regards to the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. Within the jurisdiction of Area A, does the Palestinian Authority or Palestinian law enforcement have the right to arrest settlers that that are? Uh, attacking Palestinian homes or Palestinians? Uh, that'll be, that's a question uh, I would better refer you to the uh, PA and uh, uh, officials within COGAT. I don't want to get into uh, the specifics of jurisdiction um, uh, in that level of detail from up here. Uh, go ahead, Jacob. Hmm. Uh, earlier today, Israel's COGAT published footage of what it said are contents of 700 trucks worth of humanitarian aid that is sitting on the Gaza side of Karim Shalom crossing, waiting to be delivered. Kogat said it has scaled up its capabilities over the past several weeks, but that the UN has failed to, to deliver its job in delivering aid. Ambassador Satterfield said last week that the biggest obstacle at this point is UN and international agencies bringing more trucks into Gaza in order to distribute the aid. Um, so where does this stand? The US regularly does urge Israel to boost its aid efforts, but are you willing to call on the UN also to improve its capabilities to uh, deliver the say that's piling up on the Gaza side of the border? Um, look, broadly, the distribution of aid uh, within Gaza continues to be something that we're working closely on with partners in the UN and what partners um, in other uh, additional uh, humanitarian organizations. That's something we're going to continue to uh, work with them closely on because it's a priority. I don't have any updates to offer on uh, immediate um, uh, steps that have been taken publicly, but uh, we think that that's an important uh, thing that needs to be addressed and we'll work closely continuing with the UN. Go ahead. So related to that, yeah. Biden has ordered this pier, and it's mm -hmm. going to be set up in the next couple of weeks. Is the State Department confident that you're going to find the aid groups willing to unload that gear and that those aid supplies and distribute it? Uh, I don't want to uh, get ahead of the process here, but look, when it comes to the distribution of aid within Gaza, uh, we have found uh, partners who have been willing to engage, willing to uh, uh play a role in the uh, disseminating of that aid, particularly um, as Jacob was speaking to, making sure that um, that aid gets from places like warehouses to uh, its endpoints uh, within Gaza, uh, and have no doubt that we will continue to be able to find partners to uh, cooperate with when it comes to the maritime corridor. But I don't want to get ahead of this process. Michelle. Yeah. Do you have any comments on the escalation of fighting between Hezbollah and uh, Israel? And do you expect this conflict to be broadened? Uh, we would hope and encourage not, Michelle. At every corner, we have um, stressed our uh, strong desire and importance of making sure that this uh, conflict isn't uh, widened. Um, we've made that clear to our partners in Israel and to other regional inter interlocutors, and we'll continue to do so. Um, Go ahead, Alex. On the region or anything? Uh, let me stay on the region before I move away. Sam, go ahead. Um, Euromed monitor, human rights monitor, reports that Israel is using drones to lure residents and then shoot them. Uh, they explain the sounds of women screaming and babies crying were heard late at night on both Sunday and Monday when some of the residents went out to investigate and tried to help. They were shot at. 
by Israeli quadruple uh, quadcopter drones. The sounds they heard were, in fact, recordings played by the Israeli drones with the intent of forcing the camp residents out into the streets where they could be easily targeted by snipers and other I, I've, I've not I've not seen that report, Sam, so I'm not going to uh, comment on it. But uh, broadly, not relating to this particular circumstance at all, because again, I haven't seen the report and I'm not sure if it's accurate or verifiable. Uh, at every conversation that we have with our partners in Israel, we continue to stress the moral and strategic imperative that they have uh, to uh, work on deconfliction mechanisms and to ensure that uh, civilian harm is minimized in every which way possible. And we'll continue to stress that every way we can. Will you Go look ahead. at this report? I am sure we'll look at this report, Sam. I don't have any comment for it on it right now. Do you recognize the Geneva Conventions as applying? I, I've to answered your question, Sam. No, you've, had, you've evaded it, and uh, your colleague um, deceitfully um, uh, responded to it. Do you recognize the Geneva Conventions? It's a simple question. Go ahead. Do you recognize the Geneva Conventions as Go applying ahead. to Gaza? When you interrupt me, that's not. It's not, not a matter of. You. I'm, I'm not going to simple take question, additional simple questions. To a simple question. Go ahead. You got two no, questions. It's I'm totally contrary. No, I didn't get two questions. You did. You asked. No. You, you you asked I a asked question a about question your report, and you asked a follow up. Please go ahead. Another, and you're not refusing. You're refusing to answer it. Go ahead. Sir. Do the Geneva Conventions apply to Gaza or not? Go. Apply to everywhere on the planet except for the Palestinians. Isn't that right? Isn't we that continue to stress everywhere and everywhere that Geneva international Geneva humanitarian law apply. needs to be abided by and respected. Go Geneva ahead. Geneva Conventions apply. You are now interrupting your colleague. Go no, ahead. I'm interrupting you. I'm not interrupting you. I'm insisting on an answer to a critical question. Go ahead, sir. I'd like to ask so, uh, so about the sanctions the against Iran. I'd like to ask about the sanctions against Iran. Yeah. Just broadly speaking, what impact do you think they'll have? And then I'm just curious, given all of Iran's bad actions in the past, I was almost surprised that there was room left for any new sanctions. Uh, why is there room left for more sanctions? So it's important to take a, a, a step back and talk about uh, our sanctions and export controls on Iran in a little bit of a, a wider context going back to the onset of this administration. Uh, it's important to remember that we have not lifted a single sanction on Iran. Rather, we continue to increase pressure and uh, our extensive sanctions on Iran remain in place and we continue to enforce them. And over the last three years, we have actually sanctioned over 600 individuals and entities uh, connected to the full range of Iran's problematic and dangerous behavior touching the areas of UAV and missile proliferation, terrorism, terrorist financing, um, and other forms of illicit trade and human rights abuses. Uh, but this is something that we are also going to continue to work closely with our allies and partners, including at the G7, on ways that we can continue to exert pressure uh, on the Iranian regime. We believe that our sanctions are effective they are a way to uh, uh, continue to isolate countries and to exert uh, pressure on them uh, as it relates to their behavior. And, and the impact on the new, new sanctions? Look, I'm not going to preview any additional uh, actions from here, but we continue to believe that should there even additionally be new sanctions, that that continues to be a lever at our disposal to continue to hold uh, the Iranian regime accountable for its actions. So, but not, it's just not true that you haven't lifted a single sanction on Iran. I went through this with Matt the other day. Shortly after this administration came into office, you did lift restrictions on on uh, sanctions on Iranian diplomats' travel uh, inside and when they go when they go to the UN. I think your colleague was speaking about sanctions in the context of designating entities and individuals connected to the Iranian regime, not necessarily parameters that exist around diplomats in the United States. And I then, take your point, Matt, but I think I then, think well, that. So, but it's not then true to say that you haven't lifted a single sanction on. Because you have, I th and I then secondly, you you have also you also allowed several uh, UN sanctions to expire. Now you guys can put as many sanctions as you want in place against Iran, but they don't have any impact outside of the U.S. jurisdiction. It doesn't. There's no requirement for other countries to follow suit, even when they involve secondary sanctions. So. The, the arms embargo the, 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 and, the, and, and the missile sanctions from the UN were allowed, they were allowed to expire, correct? That is, that, that is, are you talking about the, um, 
the uh, the ones in uh, from they from August twenty twenty in the JCPOA. Yeah, correct. They right. So they expired. That is so those sanctions, the international sanctions, the UN sanctions, the one that the entire world, everyone in the world is supposed to follow, were in fact <laughs> lifted. They expired. Correct? Well, I think there's a difference between lifting and expiring, but sure, Matt. There is. There's a technical difference. I, 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 what? There, there is a technical difference between sanctions expiring or sunsetting versus actively making the policy decision to lift certain sanctions. So the point is that you could have made an active policy policy decision on a snapback, which would have kept those and sanctions in that place. Is a, that, that's a mechanism. The snapback mechanism hasn't expired, man, and it remains in place, and it's an available option. But it hasn't can, been used. Uh, I'm not going to preview fact, actions from here. Have, those two things expired. In other words, you allowed them to... Uh, to, to be lifted, to expire. So I, I, it's a bit disingenuous to say expiring isn't the same as lifting. I don't think it's disingenuous at all. I don't think, as I said, snapback oh. is a mechanism that continues to remain in place. Um, and again, I think your colleague was referring to sanctions and restrictions in the context of, uh, in the economic sense, not travel restrictions. That's, that's, that's we may fine, have but the way you answered his question Matt is touched you have a not bit lifted yesterday. a single sanction on Iran, and that's not true. Well, we can agree to disagree. Alex, go ahead. Thank you. I shift into a different sure. if I may. Uh, anything else in the region before you uh, totally shift away? Uh, are you sure on the region? <laughs> yes. Uh, you positive? My question, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, sorry. So my question is that uh, there was any, was there any conversation between uh, U.S. diplomats and uh, Chinese diplomats or Russian diplomats about the conflicts between Iran and Israel. Well, you saw the secretary had a, a phone conversation with his counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, uh, on the tail end of last week, in which um, uh, Matt spoke a little bit about this uh, last week as well, in which uh, we continued to stress with them through their uh, means of communicating with the Iranian regime that no one was interested in seeing this conflict um, escalate. Uh, and we'll continue to have those conversations with appropriate interlocutors. How about Russia? Uh, I don't have any conversations. So, uh, follow up, sorry. Uh, so there are reports, uh, Wall Street Journal reported that the Iranian regime uh, uh, has evacuated their bases in, in Syria. So is there an indication that the Israeli uh, government might attack uh, some targets I, I don't have any, Iran? I don't have any uh, assessment to offer on um, what uh, our partners in Israel may or, or may not do. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for done. So Benjamin Netanyahu testified to the U.S. Congress in 2002. This is before we invaded Iraq. And he said, quote, there is no question whatsoever that Saddam Hussein is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. He then went on to say he was hiding nuclear facilities underground. We now know this was a lie, uh, one that many U.S. service members and innocent Iraqis paid the price for. Netanyahu in that same congressional hearing goes on to say, obviously, we'd like to see regime change. At least I would in Iran. The question now is, what is the best way to proceed? It's not a question of whether you'd like to see regime change in Iran, but how to achieve it. So my two questions for you are, one, how can we trust somebody who goaded our country into war in Iraq based on falsehoods? And two, given this weekend's events, why are we confident he won't do the same thing with Iran, given he's been calling for us to enact regime change in that country for 20 years? I'm not sure I fully uh, understand your question, but so let me just say a couple things. First, um, as it relates to Prime Minister Netanyahu, this is uh, uh, somebody who the president has a uh, close uh, uh, working relationship with. It's something that someone that the secretary has a uh, close working relationship with. But broadly, beyond any immediate official or individual in um, the Israeli government, our partnership, our relationship <laughs> with uh, Israel, our commitment to its self-defense and our commitment to its security transcends um, any government in Israel. It transcends any government in the United States, and it's a relationship that has pursued and persisted uh, over the course of the of various political parties and presidents. Uh, number two, as it relates to the Iranian regime, let me just uh, be clear and unequivocal about this. We condemn in the strongest terms uh, its reckless and irresponsible attacks uh, from over the course of this past weekend. Okay, but you, one, one individual, Netanyahu, is the head of the entire Israeli government, and when, you know, 
you might condemn those, but there's a difference between condemning those actions and the U.S. getting roped into a war with Iran. The United States is not interested in entering an all-out conflict with Iran. We've been and incredibly clear about that. Even if they so, strike Israel? We have been very clear about our commitment to Israel's security and its self-defense. We've also been clear uh, that we will not be participating in any offensive operation, but our commitment to its security and self-defense uh, uh, is ironclad. If I may ask on Georgia. On Jordan? Georgia. Georgia. Okay, I'm going to, people are, Michelle, do you have anything on the region before we move away? Uh, any role that Russia is playing between Iran and uh, Israel? Uh, that's a, a question for, for, for the Russian Federation. Are you I'm aware not, of that? I, I'm not, none that I can speak of or that I'm aware of. <coughs> Go ahead. You already got a bunch of questions. Then Go move, ahead. Like, move it to Ukraine, if I yeah. may. Uh, Russian missiles hit a hospital <coughs> in Chernihiv uh, this morning. Uh, they killed uh, more than actually 15 almost, and uh, more than 60 were injured. Um, what does it tell you about the state of play uh, uh, on the ground? And how under stress do you think the Ukrainian military is? This is, uh, Alex, another uh, example of a uh, horrific Russian uh, missile uh, <coughs> attack, um, this time uh, on downtown uh, uh, Cherniev. Uh, in northern Ukraine, which is uh, only about a two-hour drive uh, from the capital, Kyiv. Uh, approximately 16 people were killed, more than 600 injured, uh, including children, um, and missiles destroyed residential buildings, a hospital. Um, the images from these attacks are, are horrifying, but it also, Alex, beyond, uh, uh, to take a step back from the immediate, it underscores <coughs> the, the need of passing the National Security Supplemental. Um, our support for our Ukrainian partners, we believe, can continue to make a difference in this conflict. It can save lives, uh, but the, the, the House of Representatives needs to act now. Thank you. Stay to, uh, in, in Russia, and yeah. <coughs> there are reports that Russians are, uh, they have started moving their, their forces, slash troublemakers, if you want, out of Azerbaijan and, and to be deployed in Ukraine. Um, what do you know and, and what do you think about the implications? Well, both the South Ale and Alex, as you know, the, we were not party to the negotiated trilateral arrangement that ended the um, fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020 um, and established Russian troops in that region. Uh, Frankly, we've not seen anything to indicate that Russia's military was contributing to a more peaceful and stable South Caucasus region. And um, the events in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, over the course of this past fall are, are pretty indicative of that point. And it's a, another highlight or example of how Russia is not a trustworthy ally or partner. Uh, but beyond that, we strongly support efforts by Armenia and Azerbaijan to reach a durable and dignified peace. And we stand ready to continue to help facilitate this process. Ben, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to work the room, Alex. Please, please come back to later on. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Vinod. If I could follow up on a question that was asked yesterday sure. about China supporting Russia's industrial base. Yeah. Uh, Matt said the U.S. is very concerned that this would be on the G7 agenda, but I was wondering if you could provide any more detail, particularly what the U.S. is doing in uh, response to Chinese support for Russia's industrial base. Sure, Ben. So um, let me say a couple things on that. Uh, we believe that the PRC is supporting uh, Russia's war effort, and it, it's doing so by helping ramp up its defense uh, production. Specifically, the PRC is providing Russia with significant quantities of machine tools, uh, microelectronics, optics, UAVs, and cruise missile technology, and nitrocellulose, which Russia uses to make propellants for weapons. Together, we think that these uh, materials are filling critical gaps in Russia's defense production cycle, helping revitalize Russia's defense industrial base, which had otherwise su suffered significant setbacks due to sanctions and export controls from the United States from our partners and allies. Uh, this kind of support is actively enabling Russia's war in Ukraine, and it poses a significant threat to European security. Uh, we've raised these concerns with uh, the PRC through diplomatic channels, including uh, through uh, recent conversations at the leaders level, and we've been briefing our allies and partners on our concerns over the past few weeks. And we issued an executive order targeting third country banks that facilitate support to the Russian defense industrial base. Uh, we've sanctioned relevant firms uh, in the PRC and are prepared to take further steps uh, as necessary. 
Uh, Julio, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vedant. Uh, a few humanist questions. Let's uh, keep it to less than international. a few. Yes. A couple other people have their stop. hands up. I'll stop whenever you tell me to. Great. My first question is about these two gentlemen. One of them is very dear to America, and uh, he has my last name as well. His name is Dr. Shakila Afridi. Mm -hmm. I feel like because of lack of diplomatic courage, the Pakistani ambassador has in Washington, D.C., the guy has spent 15 years over there Pakistani lady in the U.S., Afia Siddiqui, has spent 25 years. I had a father who spent nine and a half years on a fake case. I just personally have sympathies with these prisoners who have spent, and internationally, so, like, keep the, you know, U.S. policy on side. Just from humanitarian point of view, why can't these two people be exchanged? So I, I don't have any assessment to offer on this. This seems like an internal judicial uh, matter as it relates to Pakistan's um, uh, justice system. So but the U.S. justice system, that. the U.S. justice system can get that Shakila Freedy guy here. He has spent 15 years, life imprisonment is 12 and a half years in Pakistan. So the guy has spent his life in... I just, I, I don't have anything okay. for you on that. One more question, sir. Uh, a girl from Utah, Crystal Byatt, even tweeted this today. I have raised this issue here a gazillion times. You have half of the population of country of Afghanistan where girls, since the U.S. withdrawal, are without education. Why did you not just leave them in front of the vultures to be eaten? Today, a girl was sold for $3,500 to a 60-year-old man. If the U.S. has taken, at least I know these steps cannot be stopped at the moment, but for future of girls, for the ones that are going to come in future, so what the, has the U.S. done the, in these last three years since its withdrawal? Equal rights for uh, Afghan women and girls continues to be a key tenant of our uh, Afghanistan policy, and we continue to uh, reiterate uh, regularly through relevant channels uh, with um, uh, the Taliban that uh, their self-stated goal of uh, legitimacy uh, can only be achieved uh, and will likely be impossible to achieve if half of their population is being um, left out of participating in its society, participating in its economy. Um, it continues to be a, a, a key, key factor of our approach to Afghanistan policy and it's something that will continue to work towards. Thank you. Go Just last ahead. one about... No, 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 work the roots. Go ahead. Go ahead. You like this one. Journalists become... Okay, if you today, ask today, a question, though, you yes, do this, like, wind-up thing. Has, yeah. Today, Time Magazine has a journalist, Palestinian journalist, as 100 more influential people. No country in the world protects and talk about journalists like the U.S. We have a Pakistani journalist, Arshad Sharif, got killed and we still don't know who killed him. It's been two years now. Can the U.S. and you personally take some some interest in the case and at least let us finally know who killed the guy? So let me just say broadly that uh, we believe strongly that journalism is integral to, to our society and journalists do important work. Uh, and especially in active conflict zones, they uh, every step possible needs to be taken for them to be protected. But I don't uh, have much else on uh, 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 that circumstance that you laid out. Daphne, Thanks. your hand up. Go ahead. Um, thank you. So we've seen on social media that the U.S. Embassy received a letter from Chad's government requesting troop withdrawal. Can you confirm this? The U.S. Embassy in Chad? I'm, I'm happy to check on that. I've not seen that since I, I came out, but we're happy to check with the team and see if there's anything to offer on that. Okay, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Really yeah. quick, yeah. Um, vote counting is set to begin tomorrow in the Solomon Islands parliamentary election, the first since the prime minister struck a security pact with China in 2022. Do you have any indication yet on how these elections have been conducted? Uh, I don't have an uh, assessment to, uh, to offer yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we will let uh, the process uh, play out before uh, we, we have any assessment to offer. Goyle, go ahead. Uh, come to you, then I'll come to you, and then we will wrap. Go Thank ahead, Two questions, please. Different two questions. One, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the United Nations are concerned, does the U.S. or the Secretary have a faith and trust in the U.N. because recently... Mr. Elon Musk said that uh, there is no uh, meaning of having UN without India's permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. So um, the president has spoken about this uh, 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 
before in his remarks to the UN General Assembly, the Secretary has alluded to this, to this as well. Uh, we certainly support uh, reforms to the UN institution, including the Security Council, to make it reflective of uh, the 21st century world that we live in. Um, I don't have any uh, specifics to offer on what those steps are, but certainly um, we recognize that there is a, a need for reform, but I, I will uh, leave it at that for now. And Go second, ahead. sir. Uh, please, I'm sorry. Yeah. As far as this UN, um, IMF and World Bank meetings are concerned in Washington, D.C., how does the U.S. diplomacy is uh, affecting around the globe with the other countries because uh, poor people are getting more poor and uh, also uh, the aids they get from the World Bank and IMF not reaching the needy people around the globe and because it goes to the corrupt politicians or the military uh, military people how can you uh, you think uh, it can be work for those needy around the globe there are a number of countries that are engaging uh, directly with the the IMF as it relates to the uh, economies within their own systems. Um, in those instances, we believe it's uh, appropriate to be engaging with the IMF. I don't have any uh, specifics to offer beyond that. Thank Go you. ahead, and I will come to you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yesterday, Haiti. Haiti's government uh, named uh, the members of the transitional uh -huh. uh, council set to take power at some point. Yeah. Um, do you have any comment on this? And uh, do you think that they could restore security in Haiti? Well, we welcome the announcement of the uh, establishment of the Transitional Presidential Council, and we commend stakeholders in Haiti for moving uh, toward democratic governance through free and fair elections. Uh, a lot of work lies ahead, specifically naming an interim prime minister, uh, but we are committed to work with members of this council, CARICOM, uh, as well as uh, other appropriate regional partners to improve the lives of all Haitians. Go ahead. The House has scheduled a vote on foreign aid for Saturday. That includes aid to Ukraine, um, which has been long delayed. You talked a little about the importance of that aid coming through for Ukraine, but tell us how much damage has been done by the lengthy delay in Congress to the Ukrainian war effort, because the Russians have made significant advances over the past several months. Well, uh Alex uh, raised this issue and uh, opened up this topic by talking about a missile attack from the Russians. So um, uh, it, it certainly would not be hyperbole to say that every day matters. Um, and the House, we believe, needs to act this week to uh, support Ukraine and Israel as they respectively defend against Putin and the Russian Federation and the Iranian regime. Um, and so this is something that we uh, need Congress to provide urgently. Uh, there's also, when we're talking about the National Security Supplemental, talking about things like like humanitarian assistance and efforts to strengthen security in the Indo-Pacific. These are all things that are of vital importance to the, our foreign policy and the national security interests of the American people. You had a question on Georgia. Go ahead. Uh, we witnessed a hor horrific violence in Georgia yesterday by the riot police uh, against peaceful protesters, journalists, and opposition leaders. Um, today, another protest is taking place against the Russian law, and uh, there is an ex expectation that police will uh, and government, government will use uh, force again. What message do you have for Georgia and to Georgian people? You're speaking about the protests around the draft law? Yeah. So we remain deeply concerned that uh, this draft legislation, if enacted, could stigmatize civil society organizations working to improve the lives of Georgian citizens and media organizations operating uh, within the uh, within Georgia to provide information to Georgian citizens. Um, we think that civil society, journalism, media organizations are cornerstones to any uh, democratic society. And we urge the Georgian government to heed warnings that this bill is not in line with the European Union's norms and values, and it certainly would negatively impact Georgia's progress on its EU path. All right, thanks everybody. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> just make a good. Good. The first hearing today was 83 votes, mm -hmm. and you just reflected some same thing that Matt told us pre previously that you yeah. hope that it will not go forward. So I understand there were meetings between the US ambassador and Western ambassadors and the Russian uh, prime minister. Is diplomacy your efforts diplomatically? Is dead here, or is it just another bomb on the road? We never think diplomacy is dead, Alex. Um, so again, we will continue to uh, urge and reiterate the with the Georgian government our uh, our dire concerns of this kind of legislation and uh, heed the warnings that uh, this kind of uh, legislative 
um, this kind of legislation, sorry, is is not in line with the EU's uh, norms and values, uh, which would certainly negatively impact Georgia's stated goal uh, to eventually become a uh, party to the to the European but Union. They, they also pushed an amendment or tax law today, a separate process that will allow them to you know transfer the frozen their assets from abroad. Clearly, they're they're preparing for hedging. You know, uh, you know, they're trying to avoid sanctions, potential sanctions here. Aren't you too late to? Uh, uh, I'm not. The, I'm not familiar with this other piece of uh, of legislation, Alex. But I'm happy to to check for you, Matt. Yeah, sorry. I just want to go back to something that was raised a little bit earlier. Can you ask? Can you find out from L or from whoever if the United States believes that the Geneva Conventions apply universally, in other words, to everywhere? Uh, on the planet as, uh, uh, and also the same question on the Vienna Conventions. Uh, and obviously the question before was about whether Geneva Conventions apply in Gaza, but then the specifically it would be whether the Vienna Convention applies in Syria. Uh, uh, or, or, are there, or, or do you, does the administration think that there are certain exemptions to, uh, to these conventions? That's sure. I don't expect you to have an answer, but maybe you could. Add. Well, Matt, let me just let me close out by saying that uh, I, I will echo again what I uh, when I when responding to to your colleague that it is our sincere uh, belief that international humanitarian law needs to be uh, abided by um, everywhere, uh, and that continues to be the policy we'll pursue. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.